end of our 2015 season. I'm so glad to see so many of you out early in the month and on a rainy night. Thank you. I'm sure it will be worth it. I am Sarah Holliday, Library Events Coordinator. As we begin, may I remind you, please, to turn off those little quantum machines we all carry in our pockets these days or anything else that might interrupt the presentation. We appreciate it. So I was a little stuck for an introduction to tonight's event, and then last week I went to the Samuel J. Friedman Theater and saw this new play called Constellations with Jake Gyllenhaal and Ruth Wilson. Anybody seen that? Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. At the beginning, the two characters meet cute at a barbecue, then the lights blink, and they don't meet cute at a barbecue. The lights blink, and they meet cute, but he's married. The lights blink, they meet cute, but she's awkward, and so forth. If I'm making it sound like a really irritating play, it's not. It's actually really good. It's very clever. Does use a gimmick, which might as well have been drawn from tonight's event. As Wilson's character explains later in the play, what they're showing us is a quantum multiverse where all the variations of everything that might ever have happened exist simultaneously. It's a solid scientific concept, but it's one that most of us can't get our heads around without art and especially philosophy. That's where I'm grateful for tonight's book, The Quantum Moment, by Robert P. Kreese, a philosopher, and Alfred Scharf Goldhaber, a physicist. Unlike some folks in their fields, these two experts have wonderful skills in explaining mind-blowing concepts. Professor Kreese teaches philosophy at Stony Brook University and is also the author of World in the Balance, The Historic Quest for an Absolute System of Measurement, among other titles. Professor Goldhaber teaches physics at Stony Brook and researches topics from elementary particles to cosmology. We're honored to have them with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm Robert Kreese. So I'm going to be talking first, and then Professor Goldharper Gold will talk, um, and then would, would uh, appreciate uh, questions if, if you have any. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to say, I'd like to ask you, how many of you have heard of the phrase quantum leap? Okay, how many of you have heard of the phrase Heisenberg uncertainty principle? How many of you have heard of the phrase Schrodinger's cat? Oh, so you're all physicists. <laughs> well, how could it be? This was, this was the motivation um, in part for writing the book. How could it be that all of these terms from a remote corner of physics have come into the mainstream so that these kind of phrases show up, which were, which were um, once the domain just of physicists, now show up on, on coffee cups and t-shirts and, and in philosophy texts and on Broadway or off-Broadway, right? I haven't seen Constellations yet, but it's Broadway? Oh, I gotta see it then. Um, so, but, but if you know these phrases from quantum physics, you're not alone. A number of our politicians and entertainers are quite well versed in the language and vocabulary of, uh, of uh, quantum mechanics. Um, here are a few that I just sort of uh, pulled off, off the internet. Um, but again, how, how could this be? How could these, these terms go from, um, go from physics into, into everyday language? And it's not just, uh, not just here. There are others that you'll see as well, too. The largest cruise ship under construction right now is called Quantum of the Seas. The, there's a dishwasher fluid called Quantum Dishwasher Fluid, <laughs> and so on. If you look around, you will see quantum vocabulary permeates, um, permeates uh, uh, a, a lot of everyday uh, discourse. Now, um, let me say that this is not all, it's, it's not just, um, th there's some very serious uh, uses of, of quantum vocabulary. This is, has anyone read uh, um, Alison Bechtel's book, uh, Fun Home? It's a really marvelous book. I think it was New York Times Book of the Year or something, 2000, 2006. Um, but she uses, you know, it's about her, her coming out and, and her father's suicide. And there's a moment when her father brings her to New York City uh, and she says, uh, perhaps it was a contact high of a different sort it had only been a few weeks since the Stonewall riots, I realize now, and while I acknowledge the absurdity of claiming a connection to that mythologized flashpoint, might not a ling lingering vibration, a quantum particle of rebellion still have hung in the humectant air? I think that's really beautiful, very eloquent, but it's a really interesting use of the word quantum for a, um, 
uh, in, in, a, um, in, in a piece of writing. Now, let me say, um, the, the, before I talk more about quantum vocabulary, let me say that, the, um, that scientific terms, even technical scientific terms, often go from science into the mainstream. You know, this is not something unusual. Science is part of culture, it influences culture, and this happens all the time. It's not necessarily wild and, and crazy. Here's uh, a cartoon that I pulled from, from the New Yorker. I'm sure you all know the sentiment. E entropy is, was a technical scientific term coming from thermodynamics. Uh, Thomas Pynchon wrote a short story called Entropy. Uh, Tom Stoppard uh, uses and refers to entropy a, a lot in, in his plays. So this is an example of, the, uh, of, uh, of, of a scientific term making it into the, the mainstream. Um, evolution is another one uh, that, that has contributed uh, terms to the um, uh, terms that people are familiar with. And there's this iconic image of you know, the progress of evolution that, um, what's his name, Stephen Jay Gould uh, used to complain about a lot because evolution doesn't quite work that way. Still, the image of a, you know, of a progress has, been, is, uh, has, has gone into popular discourse and is, um, is very familiar. We recognize it immediately. Actually, I saw one once that showed the size of coffee going up and then suddenly going down again, but I, I couldn't find it when I was th this afternoon when I was making the slide. Um, but in any case, so, so we were, uh, Professor Goldhaber and I were interested in this process by which the terms of quantum mechanics go, go from physics into the, the mainstream. And for over um, six or seven years, I think, we've been teaching a course on the subject. Um, and thanks to ProQuest historical newspapers and Google search engine, you can track how each of these terms moved from, whoops, I pushed the wrong button, into, into uh, for, from science into um, uh, public language. Uh, the term quantum was invented, so, so we have just, just a list on the list. Uh, wh when these terms appeared in um, scientific literature, um, where they appeared from, and then how, uh, how they became applied metaphorically. And so you can track e e the paths of each of these into the um, into uh, um, everyday discourse. And I'll just talk a, a, a little bit about, in, in the course we go over all of these, I'll just talk a little bit about two of them, um, and then maybe in the question and answer period, if you have more, we can, we can talk further. Let me just talk about the phrase uh, quantum leap. Uh, I'll talk about quantum leap and the uncertainty principle. Quantum leap um, was, it, it originated from ideas of, Niels Bohr, that the, uh, who was applying the idea of the quantum to the atom. And in, in Bohr's picture, electrons um, go from one state in an atom to another without inter any intermediate states. That is, it's not like the solar system where, uh, or, or an Earth or Moon orbit where a satellite goes from one orbit to another by slowly changing its, its position over a continuously varying time, but it will vanish from one level and, and appear, reappear at another. Um, and when Bohr wrote the original paper, the, that, that phrase, quantum leap, does not appear in that, nor does it appear for a few more, um, for a few more years. It's only in the late teens, early 20s, that um, scientists and science popularizers begin to describe it as a leap, and in particular as a quantum leap. Um, and that was just at the time that of, of mechanization of early industrialization in, in, in the United States when there were a lot of devices that, that had small discontinuous uh, transitions like typewriters, um, analog clocks, um, ticker tapes, telegraphs, all of these had small discontinuous, operated by small discontinuous movements. And so journalists began to pick up the phrase quantum leap and apply it to uh, uh, these terms. This is an era of the time set in 1922 of, of quantum leaps with ticker tapes and, and, and clocks and, and, and so forth. And slowly the term, at that time it meant, the metaphorical application was that it meant a small discontinuous transition. And ever since then it grew to apply to bigger and bigger transitions. Until now we have things like, has anyone seen the quantum leap uh, television program? I, quantum, and that's a big, they, they leap through time, right? They, 
uh, they go um, through time and space too. Or um, Quantum Leap Farm is a is a farm healing farm for uh, disabled people who who learn to heal themselves by uh, by contact with animals. Um, I have no idea what's served at the Quantum Leap restaurant, but it's in Cal it's in San Francisco, of course. Um, <laughs> and there's a uh, there was a Quantum Leap keyboard, and I guess that uh, the discontinuous transitions are, are the keyboards. But you see you see the idea and a, a term originating in, in physics meaning small discontinuous transition slowly morphs into a metaphor for discontinuous transitions in everyday language and then it, it grows and grows. Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle has another interesting story. Um, here's one of my favorite cartoons from Sidney Harris, who's a uh, science cartoonist. Um, and what's funny about this is that um, we do actually apply Heisenberg's Uncertainty Principle to everything. It's become a kind of metaphor for for many kinds of things, for for the what psychologists call the observer effect, that is, that, that if, if if people behave in a certain way, but when they realize they're being observed, they behave in a different way, um, and it becomes a kind of scientific metaphor uh, for that. We've also uncovered in our class instances where it's uh, applied to journalism. I mean, journalists know that when they interview somebody, the responses they get are, are different than if. So a friend is just asking them. The, that's, that's the context in which Obama used the uncertainty principle. He said that the, um, I think it, it was in a, an, an interview in Vanity Fair two years ago. He's, he, someone had asked him why he didn't, um, why he was known for not consulting his advisors directly. And he said, well, if I ask, the, I'm the president. If I ask people directly, I get a different answer than if they tell other people and then they tell me. So, so th that's uh, the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle um, does come to be applied metaphorically to, to in a lot of areas. Um, and that the uncertainty principle first appeared in 1927. And in March of 1927, Heisenberg sent it out in a paper in May that year. And in um, August, he made his first public presentation of, the, uh, of his work um, at the British Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, and the New York Times sent its crack science reporter who went to cover the talk and the reporter had no idea what to make of it. And the reporter wrote that um, it was like he couldn't understand it because it was pure mathematics and that if, um, that it was, understanding it was like trying to explain to an Eskimo what French is without speaking French. Um, and uh, so uh, it looked like you couldn't really explain the uncertainty principle to to outsiders, but fortunately a man named Arthur Eddington, who was kind of the Carl Sagan of, of the time, he was a, a very good astronomer, very good, uh, he was a Quaker, a pacifist, a uh, very patient person. He was, um, he, uh, was uh, a, a good popularizer, and he was in the, the middle of writing a book called The Nature of the Physical World as, this, as the uncertainty principle was, was discovered. And he devoted a chapter to it, and he did it in very clear, beautiful language that, 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 that's still wonderful to read today. And when that book was published in 1928, a lot of people read it, a lot of famous people read it. John Dewey read it, the philosopher and educator John Dewey. Um, uh, uh, other, uh, other scholars read it at the time. And it's through his explanation that the uncertainty principle began to be um, to, to come into to common parlance, and now it's applied in many different um, areas. Uh, there, there are jokes about it. It's applied to uh, religion. Um, there's entire genres of uncertainty principle jokes. Um, but as I said, it's 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 become a kind of metaphor for the observer effect. It's also become a metaphor for um, lack of of certainty, lack of causality. Um, basically, Professor Goldharbor um, will explain it in a, a, a few minutes, uh, perhaps, but it's, it's Heisenberg realized immediately that, that it meant, uh, you know, the more precisely you know the posi uh, uh, one of a pair of variables, let's say position, the less, uh, pres the, the more uncertainty there is in your knowledge of the other uh, of this pair of variables, let's say the momentum. So it seemed to undercut the principle of causality that had, um, that had, had governed science for, for hundreds of years since the Newtonian moment uh, began. Now, um, if, you take, if you take something like that, uh, th there happened to be at the time a, 
a raging controversy over free will versus determinism that was argued by, um, among others, by, by uh, religious uh, uh, authors taking the side of, of, um, of free will. And if you sprinkle a scientific metaphor like this into that kind of discussion, you get the, the, it, it was inevitable that the, the term would be picked up and used as a, uh, uh, the, 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 the would become a part of that discussion. And the uncertainty principle became part of this discussion of free will versus determinism at the time. So the Union Theological Seminary, for instance, reviewed Eddington's book and talked about the uncertainty principle. The, uh, the Christian Science Monitor reviewed uh, Eddington's book and, and, and that of, uh, of other people. Um, so the, um, so, so you got a lot of, um, oh, 19, when, 1929, the depression, the, the, uh, the stock market falls. A few days after the stock market collapsed, the New York Times half-jokingly blamed it on the uncertainty principle, saying, aha, this new principle has undone the connection between values and uh, value and price. Um, New York, uh, a year or two after that, new um, sports writers would the, the New York Giants began to collapse, blamed, the blamed it on the uncertainty principle and, and the bats being governed by the uncertainty principle. So it becomes, it enters popular vocabulary already in the late 20s, early 1930s because of, the, of, of these connections. Um, it was, it's also become the subject of jokes. Here is, um, this is XKCD. Has, has, does anyone know XKCD? Yeah, your children probably do. It's XKCD. Randall Monroe. He just came out with a new book. What's it called? Uh, what if, right? Um, it's uh, he, he's a great. Cart he's a wonderful uh, kind of geeky cartoonist. Um, and if you know kids who are geeks, they will know who Randall Monroe is. But this is a, a typical. Uh, M M Monroe has done several jokes about the uncertainty principle, um, and and this is this is one of them. Now. Um, for a while, Professor Goldhaber and I thought, wait, this is just something American. This is, uh, th this, um, this obsession with quantum terms, maybe it's, this is just something American, maybe even something New York. Um, how, how does it happen in other, in foreign countries? And then we discovered this. <laughs> this is a bottle of wine, and, and it's not just white wine, there's a whole series, red and white wines, that are called quantum wines, and they have the actual equation for the uncertainty principle on the label. Now, s think about that for a minute. Um, why would you want to do this? Obviously, this wasn't a mistake. They didn't you know, want to print. But normally, you'd expect on the label of a bottle of wine, you know, a couple kissing or a, a chateau someplace or um, you know, grape orchid, uh, or orchards or something. But why would you put it on a bottle of wine? And there's a cultural meaning to that, and, and that's the sort of thing that we were interested in, in, in exploring. So, I mean, do you have any ideas? Why would you, it still baffles me to a little bit, why would you put something like an equation on a bottle of wine? Okay. <laughs> Drinking makes things more uncertain. But ah, sophistication, that's a good answer. I mean, th this means, you know, you're, you're pretty sharp. Hmm? Well, delta is the grit. That's just the mathematical word for grit. Oh, oh, no. No, actually, this is Bulgarian. Bulgarian. Right. It's, uh, there's uncertainty to it. Why else? What, why else would you have this on the list? <laughs> okay, so there's an element of uncertainty to it. But, but you know, it's also what? Oh, that's right. That's right. Domain Domain Boyar is is what? A blend. A blend. Yeah, I don't. Well, because no specific way of drinking. Huh. Well, there's also a suggestion that you say the quantum leap above other wines. A quantum leap above other wines, but but do you see how all these meanings come into play? There's also the sense of mystery to it. The, then this the sense, as this gentleman mentioned, of sophistication that, that you know, <laughs> if you buy this kind of wine, you're not an idiot. You really know what you're... Uh, <laughs> but, oh. Actually, you know, I don't know because I went to my local uh, uh, wine merchant up on the Upper West Side and, and I, I couldn't get it. And apparent, In fact, I tried to get some because 
I figured my local wine store could order it from Bulgaria, but I, I found that the, possibly the only thing more complicated than quantum mechanics is wine sales, is wine merchandising. <laughs> Um, so apparently they're not allowed to buy, they're only allowed to buy from certain distributors and the distributors can only buy from certain foreign distributors. So, so, but I am still trying to buy a bottle of this. So if you manage to find one or go to Bulgaria, please, please let me know. But, but you see how these cultural meanings are in play. This is not a mistake. This is deliberate. So quantum, the, these, these uh, um, features, these terms and images of quantum mechanics exert a certain kind of cultural force, sophistication, mystery, uncertainty, um, what a, a fundamental too, I think, you know, f physics has a, a reputation, connotation of being fundamental. This is something basic here. Fred, you want to describe this? This is the uncertainty principle itself. The delta x, the... correctly reproduced. Yes. Is uh, delta x and delta p the uncertainty in the position uh, multiplied by the uncertainty, the momentum is greater than or equal to Planck's constant over four pi, which is equal to h, uh, h bar, or what do you put? What's the the reduced Planck? The reduced Planck's constant over two. So it's the correct formula. But but as the point is, this is not used for educational purposes. It's not here to teach you something. It's here to get you to buy wine. And in order to have that, it has a certain kind of cultural valence. And in order for it to have that. Well, that's what we were exploring through the, uh, through the book. Now, um, I should also say that, the, um, that, that sometimes in scientific terms are used outside of science. It, they can be used for um, wacky, pretentious, or incorrect ways. And the New Scientist magazine calls this fruit loopery. They're, the New Scientist term, for a technical term, the New Scientist is a magazine, one, um, and the, the, its technical term, on the, it has a, the second to last page is called feedback, and it has, it, it takes things about science that is plucked from the um, from uh, uh, popular press, and its technical term for words that are used in a pretentious, wacky, or unverifiable way is fruit loopery, um, and it finds a lot of quantum terms are used in, in, in uh, used as fruit loopery, meaning in ways that are just used to sell a product rather than having any kind of serious meaning. Um, if anything it claims to heal you, then it is definitely a uh, fruit loopery. Um, uh, the, as scientists, as biologists like to say, the brain is, is wet and warm, and when you have something wet and warm, you don't have any quantum effects. So anything that, that claims to heal you out of because of quantum reasons, this is fruit loopery. But there are serious reasons to, um, but, but still, quantum vocabulary is used sometimes outside of science in very serious ways and not just uh, in humorous ones. John Updike uses, uh, John Updike's characters sometimes use quantum vocabulary to think about themselves and their relationships. Um, here's one example from uh, the Maple Stories. Um, and w when, here's a character, uh, John Maples is, his uh, marriage is falling apart, he's trying to understand it, and he happens to pull out uh, a story about quantum physics from his, that he stuffed in his, his uh, pocket, and he reads it, and, and the, um, the, the set of images it provides help him understand a little bit more what's happening to him. Now, he's under no illusion that he's a subatomic particle, his relationship is subatomic physics, but just the, the, the use of this, this kind of framework, uh, the, this metaphorical framework, allows him to sort of grasp a little bit more what, what's happening to him. Um, and we talk about this and some examples like this in the book as well, too. There's also, uh, uh, is anyone, you know John Green? John Green's the author of um, The Fault in Our Stars. Uh, but before The Fault in Our Stars, he wrote uh, Will Grayson, Will Grayson, which um, has two characters, and this is one of my favorite examples, has two characters um, in, in it. They're both, um, uh, you know, they're in 11th grade or something. They're, they're teenagers, and, and they have mixed feelings uh, about each other. You know, she once offered him a kiss, and he turned it down, and so he, he's, he, they, they they, they are sort of afraid of one another. And at one point, they started talking about Schrodinger's cat. And Schrodinger's cat being this image of this, this uh, ambiguous state that could go one way or the other way, and it could go in two 
incompatible ways, um, and, and it, it will be forced to go in one way. It will remain in that ambiguous state until forced to go in one way or the other. And they begin to talk about it, and it becomes clear that the, while they're, though they're talking about this, this image from science, they're really talking about their own relationship. You know, has anyone done, anyone done that? You know, you talk with a significant other and you're talking about one subject, but really you're talking about your relationship and the reason you do it is, that, is so you can pull the plug if things get too sensitive. Um, that's, that's, uh, it happens, a, a, a really great example of that is in Anna Karenina when, you know, remember Kitty and Levin? They're, they're in the drawing room and, and Kitty is, has turned him down a few years ago and he was crushed and, and they begin this game uh, in the drawing room with um, uh, this letter game and they sort of wind up talking to one another sort of about letters but sort of about themselves and they work through their relationship through this surrogate speech. Well, this, uh, in, in this book, uh, quantum, the image of Schrodinger's cat is used as a kind of surrogate speech in which these teenagers uh, talk to one another. So those are some of the ways in which quantum mechanics has been used outside science for um, in, in, in popular language in ways that range from everything from fruit loopery to humor to, uh, to very serious uh, literature. So that's, um, that's just a start. Uh, now let's, uh, Professor Goldhaber will talk for a little bit and then, then we can have some questions, Fred? So we're doing things in a rather different way. Maybe we should turn that off because oh, I'm not. You do? Look at that. That was very classical, very precise. So uh, my approach to this, that is a very good idea. Thank you. Let's see if this one comes out. How is this? Do you hear me clearly? Good. All right. Um, I like to look at a few sort of, once you've gotten this introduction, a few little perspectives, different perspectives on it. One of the concepts that come up in quantum mechanics, which was hinted at by what Professor Kreis talked about, is that things which in classical physics are either very clearly particles where you can observe where they are and you can observe how fast they're moving and use that to predict what will happen to them later. And then another kind of thing is waves. And the same thing is true of waves. If you see a wave, you can uh, see how it's behaving at one time. That is, <clears throat> how its amplitude is big here, small there, and so forth, and how that is changing in time. And again, you can use that to predict what's going to happen later. Now, some people have said the reason people have trouble understanding quantum mechanics is because it isn't something that you have an intuition about, which any two-year-old would have. <clears throat> well, one of the examples of a phenomenon which I don't think a two-year-old would have much idea about is what happens when you take a superposition of waves. When you do that, the wave can be big in one place because two different waves are adding up and small in another place because they're tending to cancel each other. That's called wave interference. And I don't think too many two-year-olds understand that very well. But there's an even deeper point about this issue of, of intuition and what our intuition might be. And that is, if you can call anything intuitive physics, it's physics which existed for a long time and is usually associated with the name of Aristotle. And Aristotle had a lot of common sense statements. He was, I think, at heart, really a biologist. And he liked to make observations that are sort of botanical, classifications and so forth. So he said, things that are warm and a little bit thin tend to rise, and things that are dense tend to fall. It's a perfectly true statement. And he had a few others like that. And that was physics for almost 2,000 years until not only Newton, but a bunch of people around him came along. And they said, you can actually say an awful lot more than that, much more precisely. If you know for a set of particles which have certain forces among them, 
you know their positions at one time and their velocities at that time, you can predict precisely where they're going to be at all later times. This was a really miraculous thing. In fact, it almost seems too much. How could you be able to do that? Uh, that the very things you observed, you could use to predict at the same time. And the same thing was true, as I said before, of waves. So what happened with quantum mechanics is we discovered that if you look at the microscopic scale, everything is both particles and waves. This immediately gives rise to a huge problem. Both of these classical descriptions are complete and precise and completely incompatible with each other. So how could they both be true? And my answer to that, and I'm surprised that it isn't a cliche already, but as far as I know, it isn't very well known, is in quantum mechanics we find out that particles can be observed, but their motion cannot be directly predicted. And waves cannot be observed, that is quantum waves. We can of course observe ocean waves and things like that. But quantum waves can't be observed, but they obey an equation just as good all, as all the classical equations, which allows you to predict where they're going to go. So, Uncertainty raises its head in two ways in this situation. If I observe more or less precisely the location of a particle at one time, I don't exactly know how to describe the wave that's associated with it. So that causes a problem. So going from particle with one hand to wave with the other hand um, doesn't, doesn't uh, go perfectly. It has some uncertainty. Then, once you have the wave, the wave develops in a completely well-defined way, but to describe from the wave where you're going to find a particle, you have to take the square of the wave and then say that gives you a probability of finding the particle here if the wave is intense and much less probability of finding it over there. So the result is that uncertainty enters both when you trade off between particles and waves and when you trade off between waves and particles. So it becomes an intrinsic aspect of quantum mechanics. And uh, <clears throat> that, that's a really amazing change. But when you come to think of it and you imagine going back to Aristotle, you could say Newton and his contemporaries really had too much. They said you can do everything with perfect precision. By what you observe, you can predict what you will find. And quantum mechanics said, let's take a step back. That's not quite true. Why did that have such an impact in general culture? I think one reason was that Newton's mechanics actually, after less than 100 years, caused a huge backlash because the picture of the world was this famous clockwork universe where you could imagine it got started at one time and it went on with perfect precision after that. We might not be able to measure precisely enough to predict everything, but in principle it was all going along perfectly. And that left, as uh, Professor Kreese mentioned, very little room for the idea of free will or any kind of indeterminacy. People didn't like it the leading exponent of anti-Newtonianism was William Blake, the artist and poet. As an artist, he drew a painting of, of Newton, which at first sight looks quite glamorous. I think it's the only nude portrait of Newton <laughs> I'm aware of. But on the other hand, if you look closely at it, Newton is twisted in a strange way. You can wonder, how could he ever be in that pose? And all the interesting things are happening above him, but he's da looking down at uninteresting things below him. So it's, uh, if you like, a slightly subtle dig at Newton. But um, Blake wasn't always so subtle. For example, he had a motto, art is the tree of life, science is the tree of death. Pretty clear cut. Interesting thing is, up to now, in what's getting, what, what is more than 100 years since the first introduction of the quantum, there's never been any sign of a backlash against quantum mechanics. 
whether that's because of the reason I just mentioned, that it seems to allow more room for squishiness in the world and makes us feel a little bit uh, as if the world is more like the world we perceive, in which we aren't all that good at predicting things. Um, I don't know if that's the real reason, but for whatever reason, there hasn't been that kind of thing. So, therefore, quantum mechanics, in some sense, is intrinsically popular even if rather hard to understand. Um, now, there's another concept I'd like to talk about briefly, and that's resonance. How many people have ever heard that word, resonance? Most of you have. And one thing it means is if you have a sound coming from somewhere and it comes into a bell and it's at the right frequency so that bell reacts to it, then the bell will start sounding. That's classical resonance. But resonance can be used in another way, too. Uh, you can say maybe quantum mechanics has influenced general culture. You can also find people who will say general culture has influenced quantum mechanics. Uh, most of the time, I think those claims don't hold up. But at the very least, you can find uh, resonance, meaning things happening in different areas like arts and, and quantum physics can somehow seem to be going in the same direction at the same time. And a beautiful example of that is a principle introduced by Niels Bohr, which both physicists and non-physicists seem to have a lot of trouble understanding, which he called complementarity. And it meant if you are looking at something in one way, uh, then you can see certain aspects of it, but if you look at it in a different way, you could see different aspects of it. And it has been suggested that maybe Bohr got this idea from cubism, because in cubism, you look at pictures where the thing you're looking at is somehow broken apart, and you see it from various angles in different parts of the picture, and you somehow have to put it back together and make it into a whole. Um, what is quite certain is that at least some of the practitioners, initial practitioners of cubism, got the whole idea from mathematics, because mathematics at that time was starting to talk about more than three space dimensions. And if you have more than three space dimensions, then even never mind a, a picture, even with a sculpture, you can't visualize them all at the same time. So you have to break them up and have one view from the first three dimensions and another view from the fourth dimension and put them together. So that idea certainly uh, gelled with, with uh, what went on in, in quantum mechanics in Bohr's description. And perhaps for that reason, Bohr bought a cubist painting and he kept it at home and when he was talking to people he would say, you see, you can get the feeling of what I'm talking about by looking at this painting. Um, actually, the particular painting that he had, which is quite an interesting one, is one that I've tried to look at a lot. And what I found was, this is a painting with the title, Woman on a Horse. Looking at the painting, I can see the woman very clearly, but I can't see the horse. <laughs> So I don't, I don't know what went wrong, but uh, somehow I, I wasn't able to, to get that out. So the, the point is then, or one of the points that I'd like to make, is that quantum mechanics may or may not have been influenced in its formation by general culture, but it certainly has resonated with a lot of things in general culture, which I think has made the quantum physicists seem a little more com feel a little more comfortable and has also made the uh, general public feel there's something in this for me, although I may not be sure exactly what it is. And we discuss, of course, a lot of examples of that in our book. And let me put in a little plug. Uh, on this month, until the 29th of the month, there's an ex exhibition going on at Stony Brook in a gallery uh, in a beautiful new building at Stony Brook called the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics. And that gallery uh, has a number of pictures, including the one I just mentioned about uh, the woman on a horse, 
but also several pictures which involve the more uh, classical wave notion of resonance, uh, a painting in which you see how a quantum wave is moving along and it goes through a little hole and then it gets trapped between that little hole and a big backdrop so it goes back and forth between them and you get a nice resonance which means that even though the hole was very tiny, there's a big amplitude of the wave in the region behind the hole and going up. That's a very beautiful picture, I think. And it's an example of something you could have discussed in, with sound waves or water waves. But in this case, it turned out to be used uh, for a description, an accurate description of a, an atomic system which has dimensions of uh, smaller than, uh, smaller than uh, wavelength of light. So it's really small, but it still has all these interesting features. So there are a lot of things going on in many different directions in which quantum phenomena can go uh, and which we can grab onto and somehow relate them to something that we're interested in. So I think with that, I'll stop. And if people have any further questions, like what did you say because you didn't hold the microphone close enough, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> then I'm glad to respond. And I'm sure Professor Kreese will also be glad to respond. Yes. That's a very good question. The question, uh, very important to repeat the question. Uh, it was stated before that a wet and warm system will not have quantum effects. And that sounded a little bit strong. The question is, is that really true that there are no quantum effects in the brain, which is wet and warm, except perhaps for some very cold-blooded people? Um, and I think the answer is it depends what you mean by uh, quantum effects. One would be coherent quantum effects where the brain as a whole was in some wave function. The other would be all the little parts of the brain are relating to each other and there can certainly be quantum mechanics going on in how they relate to each other. Uh, I'll give you a, a closely related issue which is if you look at the way we perceive the world, the sort of first thing you think about is sight. And sight is definitely a quantum phenomenon. Why? Because light waves come into your eye, but the way you detect the color is that particular molecules get excited by particular frequencies of light. And that is definitely a quantum leap kind of phenomenon. That in turn sends a signal to the brain. How quantum that is, I'm not absolutely sure. But nevertheless, Therefore, the process of perceiving the world visually is definitely a quantum process. But the quantum part is, if you like, on the microscopic aspect. When you look out at the world, you see that bookcase, for example, back there and the different colors of the different books. Uh, that's a macroscopic, a big image. But it's made up of lots of little microscopic parts, and each one of those came from from the process I mentioned of exciting molecules in your eye. It's claimed that only a few photons are enough uh, at a particular frequency to excite a sensation in the eye that I'm seeing that frequency. But of course that means when you're looking at, at something in the room or at the bookcase, you're seeing a huge number of photons and and the brain is integrating all that information. So there's definitely a quantum step. Is the whole process quantum is the process of transmission of the signal uh, in the brain, uh, in the nervous system to the brain, and then the processing of it in the brain. Is that all quantum in the same, in a different way as well? I think that's much less clear. And there are many people who would say no. So I think that's the kind of thing he was talking about. In other words, we're wet and warm as a whole. Are we quantum phenomena? Yes, we are. If quantum mechanics were not right, 
then all the atoms that we're made of wouldn't be there. They'd all collapse. And so there wouldn't be any we. So we are definitely quantum phenomena, but there's a lot that's classical about us, too. I hope that got to it. Yes? Okay, um, the question was, can I comment on how Einstein came to accept quantum mechanics? The answer is, it's not clear that he ever did. On the other hand, there's a different question you could ask. Did Einstein understand quantum mechanics and exactly how it worked? The answer is, he certainly did. Now, I think there's a very good case for saying that if you had to pick out one person who made more of contribution to quantum mechanics than anybody else, including Schrodinger and Heisenberg, it was Einstein. In particular, Einstein was the one who introduced the notion that light, which everybody knew by then was a wave phenomenon, is also a particle phenomenon. And interestingly enough, Einstein, as you know, is probably most famous for his general theory of relativity, which thanks to the observation of the eclipse in 1919, the solar eclipse, um, made him into the first and still greatest scientific rock star. Many th theoretical physicists have said if Einstein had not developed the general theory of relativity, it might have taken decades before anybody else came along and thought of it. We have a concrete example, uh, and so let me go back a step. Uh, when Einstein got his Nobel Prize, it was not for the general theory of relativity. It was for the theory in that paper of 1905 I was just talking about, where he introduced the idea that light is made of particles. And the interesting thing is that until approximately the time when he got his Nobel Prize, in other words, not quite 20 years, he was the only important scientist who believed that light is a particle phenomenon. There was nobody else. In particular, there was one man who decided to check him. And by the way, you know, normally you might not feel, most of you, that you could sit down and read a paper in a physics journal. But there's a paper by Robert Millikan in about 1915 in which he describes his experiments to test Einstein's predictions on the photoelectric effect. And I highly recommend to you that you read that paper. The first thing you find out is that Millikan was an incredible egotist. He proceeds to explain how he set out to do these tests, and there was Mr. So-and-so who tried it, but failed for this reason, Mr. Such-and-Such -such who failed for that reason, but of course he succeeded. Now what was the result of all his experiments? At the end of the paper he says, I have tested six different predictions one can get from Einstein's picture. All six of them are exactly verified. However, I don't believe even Professor Einstein thinks that his theory makes any sense. <laughs> that was pretty, uh, pretty arrogant of him to say, but it went with his personality. Now, another indication of the arrogance is that 20 years later, he wrote another paper in which he said, I'm the one who confirmed photons. <laughs> so he played it all different ways. But anyway, that 1916 paper is really something that you, without a lot of scientific training, can read and appreciate, get the personality, get a sense of what were the ideas he was testing. So I'd recommend that as a, a sort of a little lark outside whatever you'd be usually reading. Yes? At what stage or size of particles do the rules of quantum mechanics give way to uh, general relativity? It's a follow-up to that gentleman's question. In other words, obviously, Schrodinger has a cat. The cat is too big, so therefore, that's really more general relativity. But, so how large does a particle have to be where in which quantum mechanics falls away and gravity so the question, in case anybody didn't hear it, is uh, how large does something have to be so that it'll be classical and not quantum mechanical? Is that a correct summary? Yes. Very yes. Um, the, the answer is that's an, a question of significant scientific debate. What is known is that whenever people have had sufficiently precise instruments 
to make measurements with moderately big things, which doesn't mean as big as we are, of course, or even a cat, uh, where their measurements were good enough so they could test whether quantum kinds of effects occurred, they did. But the bigger the thing is, the harder it is to do that because you have to isolate it from all sorts of um, environmental influences which could spoil the subtle superpositions uh, that, uh, that um, Schrodinger was laughing at when he introduced his idea of the cat. So the question is, is there a maximum size when you can't do this anymore? And the answer is nobody knows. And you can find distinguished scientists who say there is a, a, an ultimate limit. I don't know what it is. And I can't exactly explain why it is, but there is. And there are other scientists who say I don't believe that. Can I make a comment on that? Please. <clears throat> Yeah, th this is a very interesting question called the boundary question, which is, um, and, and there's, uh, and, and, and the question is basically, what does the boundary between the classical and the quantum domain look like? Is it like the border between the United States and Canada, in which there's a sharp line and you're either on one side or the other side? Or is it more like the boundary between a mountain range and the, uh, the valley underneath, in which there's a series of steps and it's, uh, it's, it's an ambiguous boundary? Nobody seems to be, nobody is sure. And, and that's the issue. There's actually, we have a cartoon about that in the book that shows um, a, a sort of an imagined representation of, of a, a United States Canada type boundary where on one side there's waves and cats and, and it's kind of vague and, and then there's a, a boundary and on the other side everything is crystal clear and, and, and so forth. But it's, um, um, it's, it's, it's called the boundary issue. And, and also, what do you mean by size? Do you mean numbers of particles? Well, there's also the issue of what you're looking at. There have been uh, molecules that have been made from, from several different atoms, you know, up to buckyballs of 60 atoms, that have been made to exhibit quantum properties. Um, you, they, they do the, the double slit experiment, works on them. But, then, but, but, but still, that's, that's tiny physically. But you can also talk about uh, uh, the size of quantum states, that is, entangled states over a big area. And that you could do over... Um, that, that, that has been done over over uh, large areas. So, do you mean areas or do you mean number of particles? It's 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 a very interesting que uh, question. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, Heisenberg Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You're talking about. Is that right? His principle said, if you know exactly the position of a particle, you have no knowledge at all about its momentum, and vice versa. If you know exactly the momentum of a particle, you have no idea at all about its position. Or more realistically, if you have a moderately good idea, but not an exact idea of the position, and an exact idea, a moderately exact, but not really exact idea of the momentum, then the relationship between those two things that you know moderately well has to be such that the product of those two uncertainties uh, of the position and the momentum exceeds this very, very tiny amount given by the Planck constant. So that doesn't immediately tell you about probabilities. So you can say, where did the probabilities come in? That's your question, I think. Yes. So suppose you try to make a quantum mechanical description of a particle, and you do it by saying, the thing that I can describe exactly how it changes in time is the wave function that goes with the particle. And the way probability enters is that the square of the wave function at any point gives you the relative likelihood of finding the particle at that point. So you want to make a wave that is somewhat confined. It's not all over everywhere. 
Uh, so it's not a wave with a single frequency because a wave with a single frequency and single wavelength just goes on and on and on as an, a sine wave oscillating forever. So you need to have a combination of waves with different frequencies, different momenta, and when you take that combination, you can get a distribution which exactly saturates the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, meaning it's a wave function for which the uncertainty in position times the uncertainty in momentum is exactly the minimum given by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So that wave packet, if you look at it in position, is a pro a and when you square it, you get a probability distribution which looks like a bell curve. And if you square it in, as a function of momentum and look at it, it looks like a bell curve again. And if the bell curve in position is very sharply confined, so that means the probabilities decrease rapidly as you go away from the particular value that's the central value, uh, then the wave in momentum is going to be rather broad, meaning it has a lot of different momenta in it, so the probability distribution in momentum space is spread out. Is that answering what you were asking about? <laughs> yes, most certainly. Thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> What are the quantum mechanics? Well, uh, are you using that in the sense that uh, what are car mechanics, for example? Uh, that's a very good question. Is there such a, a, a profession in the world as a quantum mechanic? Uh, <laughs> and the answer is not usually, people don't usually use that. They say, oh, I'm a physicist or I'm a chemist, maybe even a quantum chemist, but not a quantum mechanic. And why is that? Because when we think of what a mechanic is, it's somebody who assembles some given kind of uh, system, for example, the various parts that go into an automobile, and put them together in a way that works and can repair them. So, in other words, the profession of quantum mechanic in the same sense really doesn't exist, but it almost exists because people who are, who are doing studies in quantum physics say, I want to figure out how to make a, a system where I can look at all these funny quantum mechanical details and see how they work together. And they try to imagine how they're going to put together a device which will allow them to see all that. So I think you could fairly call those people quantum mechanics. And <laughs> you'll find them in uh, every, every physics laboratory in the world. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Good. Yes. Um, can you give us a sense of where science is headed today? I'm just trying to sort of understand the sort of term incompatibility between theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. I'm trying to define mm -hmm. So the, the question, the yes. Right. The question is, uh, where is science heading today on trying to resolve the issue between the apparent, of the apparent incompatibility of the general theory of relativity, which is a purely classical theory, uh, and quantum mechanics, which doesn't really describe very directly what happens with, uh, <clears throat> with gravity and with the geometry of space. How do you put them together? There are quite a number of people who think they have one idea or another about how this might be done. And the most famous of them, the most widely studied today, is something called string theory. And it's essentially the notion that if you really were to start looking at very microscopic scales, you would see that you aren't seeing point-like particles, but you are seeing strings. And the strings, if they're, if they're sufficiently short or at least uh, rounded together to make a small object, could be what's really inside the particles. Or rather, the particles could be considered as some sort of excitations of the world of strings. So this is a very tantalizing idea, but it has several practical problems when we compare it with any previous era in physics. The, the first problem is 
that as far as the theory has been developed today and all its, all its practitioners agree that it isn't complete, uh, it has not been able to make direct predictions which could be compared with experiment. It has made some qualitative predictions which could be compared with experiment and to the extent that those qualitative predictions have been uh, tested, so far they haven't worked, which just may mean we have to go a little bit farther down the road before they would work. Uh, the ideas may still be correct. Um, so the answer is we really don't know where it's going, but I don't think that's any different from any previous era in physics. In other words, you know the things that you know, and you may know what it is you don't know, but you don't know how you're going to figure out what you don't know until you figure it out. Thank you so much. Uh, any further questions? Yeah, privately.